recording. All right, everybody, thank you for joining us for our second number two. This is the Zoom chat, Zoom of Doom, Moto Mayhem conversation, Zoom chat number two. Uh, this should open a little bit smoother than the last one. So today we have as our special guest, Ned. Ned needs very little introduction. If you have followed anything on ADV, if you've been involved in Moto for the last couple of years, if you have been to um, any of the big national shows or events where the manufacturers and reps are there, you've seen Ned probably wandering around. You also know Ned from his products. Let me grab one. I should have had this ready. Ned has got the double take mirrors. He's got these guys. Everyone has seen these. Everyone should be familiar with these. And if you're not, then I don't know what rock you're living under or what Yamaha you're riding but you need to get some of these on your bike. These are the best mirrors. Take your stock crap off and then get yourself some of this stuff. Ned's got that going on. Ned did the Dakar in, in uh, 2012, is that it? Yep, so Ned did the Dakar in 2012. Ned is a contributor and um, wise sage in the motorsports industry, especially the ADB universe. And so today we're going, oh, come on, he's humble too. So today we're going to talk to Ned. He's going to join us, in, and the conversation is going to be about tubes, tubeless, um, tire balls, um, all the different inflation systems, moose, everything that you can do to inflate your tires. We're going to, we're going to cover that. And so if you have questions, just go ahead and start talking. There's no problem with like butting in. That's totally fine. Your your screen may be on mute, and so you just be aware of that. Unmute, um, uh, or do a chat at the bottom of the screen. You'll see that you've got a chat feature. You can just type your question in there, and then we'll jump in and answer it. So Ned, if you're ready, it's all yours, my baby. Okay. Well, uh, anyone can jump in and stop me at any time. I I um. Uh, in the in the last one, we talked a little bit about uh, just started talking a little bit about uh, tires, and it seems like that's a common question that everybody has and wonders about and, about and so on. Um, oh, I think we got someone maybe feedback. Is that me? I don't know. All right. Somebody's um, feedback. Uh, so in any event, um, I just thought I'd try to share uh, the product of some testing that I've done over time. Might be Steve. Yeah, Steve. Oh. Hey, Steve. Let me mute Steve. I can do that. So I've got Steve on mute here. I, th I think that sounds better to me. Does that sound better to everybody else? Okay, yeah. So Steve, sorry about that, man. We had to mute you out. I don't, some kind of weird feedback or something. Um, so anyway, I thought, I thought, well, I'll just start talking about, about that topic. Um, uh, I guess the place to start is probably tubes. Uh, all of our bikes came with tubes in them. Uh, tubes are great. To me, tubes are kind of the default for a reason. They're inexpensive. They work really well. Um, uh, to me, there is a benefit to going to a heavy duty tube over a, a sort of standard or light duty tube. Um, you can... Uh, carry a light duty tube as your spare, but I think it's probably worth putting heavy duty stuff in and probably some sort of sealant as well. Like slime is the kind of old school example, but bike shops all have stuff like um, stands or whatever that might be even better as far as being able to seal up a, a, a minor hole, like a thorn or, or something along those lines. Um, Ed, can you talk about why you think a Bridgestone ultra heavy duty tube might be the ultimate tube? and then drop back and talk about the different products slime and how there's different versions of slime and maybe how that might compare to say stands or some of the other um, sealant products. Yeah, so the, the first one I can talk about for sure. So the quality of the rubber uh, in the tube matters, the, thick, the thickness of the rubber in the tube matters and the, um, uh, the valve stem, I've seen some pretty crappy valve stems on, on sort of bottom end generic tubes. Uh, like a Bridgestone or a Michelin, they both make real high-end tubes, and I think I think are probably the the best uh, items available. Um, 
Uh, as far as it goes with sealants, I'm actually not the expert on that. Um, I've used stands because I have it sitting around for my mountain bike, uh, but I mostly don't run uh, very much. Um, I don't run tubes in anything except my 950. Everything else I run on bibs. So if you have opinions on the different kinds of slime and, and sealants and stuff, I'm, I'm not an expert on that topic. Well, yeah, so I don't know how expert I am. Anybody else can jump in if they've had a lot of use. So there are different kinds of slime. There are two, there's two kinds. There's the tubeless kind and then the, 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 the non-tubeless kind, I guess, is what it is. And they have different size components suspended within the, the sliminess, the slime material. And they are just different sizes. And so it's a different size of the, the bits, the little rubber bits, the stringy bits, the, the fibrous bits. And you want to make sure that you use the one that's compatible to the system that you have. So if you're running tubeless, then you would not use the tube type because that is smaller. The tube type, the grit is smaller than it is if it's specific to a tube type. So you want to run the one that's specific. And then um, the other, now stands is very similar. It doesn't have chunks of rubber in it. It has a, it has a different type of material so that when it is exposed to outside air, ambient air, non-humid air. So basically the humidity inside of the tube chamber keeps it you know, liquefied, but as soon as it dries out, it dries to a latex type of, uh, um, it, it gets like a latex, uh, scab on it, I guess. And that's what, that's what does some of the, the sealing. So I don't think I have any personal preference over any of them. I think they all are pretty equal. Um, so that's my piece on that. Does anybody else have any thoughts or experience? So the, I'm jumping in cause I didn't hear anything. Uh, the thing I would say is the downside of tubes is you have to run adequate air pressure in order to prevent having pinch flats. And so some people like a real soft feel like for more technical, you know, extreme terrain kind of stuff. And so a tube is probably not the answer for that extremely low pressure feel. And then that's one. And then two is you have to carry a pump and a spare tube and tire irons and all that stuff. So if you have a failure on the trail, you have a way to, to get back home. Um, one thing I think a lot of people have heard this and I've experienced it and you've done it many times, you can use a 21 inch tube in a rear 18 inch wheel. So if you're going on a trip and, or maybe a trip you wanna bring them both, but if you're going uh, on a ride, you can bring only a 21 inch tube and then you, that will uh, conform inside your 18 inch rear wheel. So you don't have to have both an 18 and a 21 along for, uh, you know, to, to have a way to get back out. Yes, good point, good point. Um, what can you talk about as far as the different grades of tubes? So there's the tube that your bike came with, your, your OE factory bike came with, you know, if you buy an EXC, it came with a thin, flimsy motocross grade tube. Um, and then you can go to an aftermarket and you can get aftermarket tubes. There's heavy duty, ultra heavy duty. What, um, what can you talk about as far as that different grades of tubes? Yeah, so uh, I like the stock tube is a great tube to carry as your spare because it is light and it packs down fairly small. I, I don't, that's, whenever I buy a bike, the first thing I do is rip the, um, typically wind up taking, especially bought an EXC and it came with a, uh, Continentals, you probably are taking both tires and tubes off and putting on something more aggressive. Um, when you do that, uh, my thought is the thicker tube is going to help prevent pinch flats. I think if you run over a nail or something, probably there's some point at which it's going to get through whatever tube you have in. Uh, but if you uh, are hitting a square edge and, and uh, one way that tubes frequently flat is that the where the rim is and where the tire is, you hit something and the tire comes down to the rim and it pinches through uh, the tube. And that is definitely dramatically reduced by having a thicker tube versus a thinner one. Um, 
And the only downside to thicker tubes is they weigh more. Uh, and the other issue is in um, like in dual sport applications, they actually hold more heat. And that can be an issue also like on a 950 type bike. I've never seen that be an issue on a, on a 500, you know, with the kind of mixed use that most of us probably do most of the time. So when I ran tubes, I ran heavy duty tubes. Uh, and I think that creates a real benefit over the stock real thin tube. I think the, the stock thin tube is a good one to carry just because it's not so bulky or heavy to, to have to lug around with you. So. Three. Yeah, so I agree with all that. I have a lot of experience with tube testing and we've run the different brands. Um, I've only run, so I guess, let me, let me qualify that. I've spent a lot of time testing the different ultra heavy duty tubes from many manufacturers, Motos, um, Bridgestone, IRC, oh, there's a handful of, of makers, probably five that make, you know, quote, ultra heavy duty tubes. And so we have had failures, valve stem failures, Motos, Motaz were probably the, 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 the ones that failed quickest. Um, and those, I, I, I typically don't recommend those. I don't sell those and I don't recommend those. Um, I like their tires. I like a lot of their products. Those tubes did not work out. And, and they just kind of went up from there with Bridgestone Ultra Heavy Duty being the best. They're six mil and they use a, um, a very high uh, blend of natural rubbers. So much so that they're difficult to patch. Um, you cannot use a vulcanizing fluid. They don't, you can't patch them. You can't patch them with the glue patch. The only way that you can patch a Bridgestone Ultra Heavy is with um, the vulcanizing process. Is anybody familiar with vulcanizing? Remember back in the day when you used to put on a patch, you had this little, um, I'm only going from memory because I saw my grandpa do it once to a truck tube. It's that thing where it's a little piece of uh, gel, flammable gel, and you have it in a, a weird cup, and then it's a friction thing. I'm doing a terrible job of describing it, but you have to light the thing on fire. It has to be really hot, and then it, Nick, yeah, you're kind of, I think you know, Nick, you're on mute. Let me unmute you here. Did you ever do that? You would have to, it, I don't know what the solution was or what it was that they were using back then, but I've done it in the past and you have to use a certain tool to basically run the two rubbers together and let them adhere. Um, yeah, it was, it was a lot more of a process than the, the normal stuff. Yeah. So the only downside that I would say that comes along with the Bridgestone Ultra Heavy is the weight. They are heavy. They weigh like five pounds. And then you put some salt, you put eight or 10 ounces of slime in there. And now you got something that's almost like seven pounds, six and a half, seven pounds. That's a lot, but we're talking about ultimate survivability. So you're making these trade-offs. If you want ultimate, if you want to reduce gyroscopic effect to the maximum, then you use a motocross tube. If you want survivability, you use bridge and alter heavy. So everything is a compromise and a trade-off. And the one disadvantage that I tell guys who are running these tubes on a long distance enduro type situation, overlanding, you're not gonna be able to patch it. You have to figure out how to vulcanize it. And you either bring that, that equipment or you understand that process yourself. If you're in a third world country, they still do it. We don't do it in the US because it lets off an insane amount of chemical smoke, pollutants, like it's disgusting. You have to get away from this. It's, it's really strong. Um, but if you're in a third world country, that's pretty much all they do. So that's my piece about the Bridgestone Ultra Heavy, the best tube, but no repair. No, there's really no, think of it as essentially you can't repair it in the field. The other tube you can, because they will take a, a vulcanizing chemical patch. They'll, they'll take the glue. Um, anything else on that? I agree. I've had experience in Baja where, you know, there's, um, um, little tire shops all over the place every everywhere you go and those guys know how to vulcanize and I, I i imagine those guys could probably get a patch to stick to a bridgestone have you had experience with that i've never i've never vulcanized in mexico but i do know and i agree with you that in the third world you're going to find guys who know how to vulcanize and do it currently in the u.s it's a non-thing so if you're running that bridgestone ultra heavy and you pull into some place in california and you want them to patch it like it's not going to happen you have to you have to vulcanize it yourself um, so just, you did need to be aware of that. So the Bridgestone Ultra Heavies are the best, but they're not patchable. That's their downside. 
Any other air quote ultra heavy tube is in my opinion, not worth it. Don't, don't spend your time or money investing in someone else's ultra heavy duty tube. It, it, the second place at best. If you're running air, if you're running tube, that is. So should we move on to the next technology? I think so. I think we've kind of covered tube. Does anybody want to stay on tubes for, for anything else? I pretty much agreed with all that stuff. Tubes are easy to put in. They're probably the easiest to install. They're the most widely used. Anywhere in the world, you're going to be able to get a tube. Let me throw two last things on on tubes that um, I've, I've learned over the years. I always slime my tubes with silicone grease. So I either use, so in the shop, I have a gallon jug of it's made by ultra lube out of texas and it's an it's a it's a sin so the grade of it the weight of it is like sin 5000 and it's thick like kerosene i don't understand what that rating system means but it's thick like kerosene and um i use that and or the lube tube that comes with any mousse that's also a silicone product and i i lube my tubes with silicone grease when I install them for a couple of reasons. One is it makes it easier to install. It, it almost completely eliminates the possibility of pinch flat while you're installing. If you have it on the, the rim and you need to, you know, sometimes you get it on there and even you, though you use your best care, the stem is wonky, right? You get, you, get you, you, you thought you took good care, but the stem ends up like this. Well, if it's got silicone in there, you can, you know, straighten it out really easily. That's a benefit. And then the last benefit is if you were in a situation where you probably would have got a pinch flat, the silicone, the slimy tube is not a guarantee. It's not an assurance that you're not going to get a, a pinch flat, but it's a nice bit of advantage in your favor because if the tube is slimy and there is the possibility, if the universe is on your side today on that rock hit, if you have a slimy tube, there's the chance that it's going to squirm itself, squirt itself out of that contact point, and you will potentially prevent that one pinch flat that you may have otherwise had. If you've got baby powder in there, it ain't going to happen. If it's dry, it ain't going to happen. So at least stack the, uh, the chance in your favor by having it slimed up. Don't use petroleum grease. Um, it will counteract with the rubber and deteriorate the tube. You, you really should well, the, the, okay, so if you do that, then you'll decrease the life cycle of the tube, which is maybe not a problem if you're changing tubes every single tire. But I'm thrifty and cheap, and I like to do these experiments. I've run Bridgestone Ultra Heavy Duty tubes in the rear through like eight or nine tires as an experiment to see how long it would last. It was silicone. And, and I finally had to replace that because it, it flatted out with a, with a screwdriver in Mexico. So I've gotten eight, I think it was eight, eight tires out of one Bridgestone Ultra Heavy, always lubed with silicone each time. I think we did that with petroleum grease and we, and it kind of, the rubber just went weird after like three. Um, if you changed it every time, it would be okay. So there's my thought on, on grease and greasing your, your tubes. Can I just, can I just add a, a note on, um, do we have, and talks about rim locks and since you're talking about grease on the tube i don't know if it you know makes uh, it has a negative effect on the possibility of you know um the tube shifting inside the tire and having a problem with the valve but i guess rim locks um are a good idea with this kind of application i mean i've had really good experience with rim locks in general um, they're a bit of a pain when you install, but I think they're worthwhile just to guarantee the stems stay in their place. I don't know how everybody feels about that. So what, one thing I would say about that is my experience has been if you're under about 18 pounds of pressure, you probably need to run a rim lock with a tube. I have never greased my tubes. What Mike is saying makes sense. I don't have experience with it, but I feel like, uh, um, when I've run, when I run like a dual sport wheel, uh, where I'm going to be at 18 or more, and typically maybe more even like 30, then I don't run a rim lock just for the balance. And that has never been an issue for me. 
Yeah, Pablo, that's a really good observation. So one of the things I do is I run a metal rim lock that is raw against the, the tire itself. So your stock, I don't use the stock rim locks because it's, ru it's rubber coated. And so you end up with rubber against rubber. And in my experience, um, the, anytime you can switch to a metal rim lock, you have a better, you have better authority of the lock against the tire itself. This happens to be a warp nine and it's kind of slick. It's aluminum body and it has a little titanium shank. The bolt here is titanium. And this is the one I run. And I've never spun a tire. I've never had an issue. We've run a bazillion miles with this exact rim lock all over Mexico and, and have yet to have a problem like you're describing. But I bet if, if I didn't have a rim lock, I bet you for sure I'd probably spin a rear, not a front, but a rear. And then as far as balancing, uh, what we do on every, so we run rim locks um, on, when we have tubes, we run rim locks front and rear and then we just balance them out. So we just use the Nomar brand wheel. Uh, these are the spoke weights. And so we just counterbalance. So at 180 degrees, we have a rim lock and then a wheel weight on every tire. And so now we're in perfect balance and that's our setup. And I've yet to have any issues with this. I guess, unless anybody raises their hand or has any other questions, let me check the chat here and see if there's anything anybody's asking about tubes. Nope, nobody's got any question about tubes. There's a tubeless question when we get to that. So I guess, Ned, we could launch, launch on. Okay. The next thing I had on the list was tire balls. Um, I feel like these are probably the least po uh, popular of the various options. Um, Mike had one that he was holding up. It looks like a breast implant. Um, the idea is you run a whole bunch of these around the inside of your tire. So the inside of the tire would maybe have, uh, I forget, something on the order of like 20 of them, 25 of them, something like that to achieve the pressure that you want. And the idea is that if you have a sharp impact exactly at the point, or you pick up a nail or something of that nature, even if one of those is flatted, the other 20 aren't. And so you maintain most of the pressure that you, you had. Um, and so I guess a couple of points of experience with those. One is that um, uh, Colton Haker, the uh, Enduracross champion for a bunch of years running, um, Chris, who's on the call there, introduced me to his mechanic. Uh, they were up here a couple years ago after the Denver Enduracross, and I was watching him set up Colton's wheels. Colton runs um, uh, tire balls. He likes the lightweight and the springy feel, so they have that kind of air spring kind of feel to them. Uh, they don't weigh anywhere near as much as like a bib moose does, but they provide you with almost the same kind of quote flat proof. Um, I feel like none of us are half as badass as Colton. Uh, Colton will flat like a couple of them over the course of a main event and Duracross main event. So they do, it is possible to flat them, but they're not, it's not like a, um, you know, a, a, an all the time thing especially for people that don't hit stuff hard enough to be 40 feet in the air off a log. Um, <clears throat> so, so I think it's a, a realistic option. The downsides of them are, so like a moose, you're putting on a, what equates to a fully inflated tire. So you, it's gonna take some technique to do. Uh, that's the first downside. Second one is they really don't hold up to dual sport use. So if you have sustained high speed where you're building heat in the tire, uh, they will melt uh, in the tire and then you'll have a lump of plastic or rubber or whatever the material is uh, that is not helping you at all. Um, and so I think there are a realistic option for like racers for like if you're on a doing an enduro race or you're out for a day ride and you want to not have to carry tools, they do give you that. But if you're going to be dual sporting or riding on the road, they're probably not the answer for you. And they're probably not the answer for any sort of like overland or expedition I probably wouldn't take them to Baja, for example. 
I agree with all that. I have taken these to Baja and it was a catastrophic failure. Um, so this basically is an air bladder. Think of this as nothing more complicated than a tennis ball. Imagine filling up your tire with tennis balls. And uh, Ned was right. You put, uh, I think, I think the last time I ran these on a rear, I had 28 in the rear and then something like 38 or so in the front. The fronts are smaller. They're maybe 50% the size and width of this. This is a, uh, it's a thick nylon proprietary type of material. I've talked to the inventor of this and he spent years and years developing this. And the concept is very simple. Um, it, it fills the chamber with unique bladders and the, um, I will, uh, the, the, the feel and responsiveness of the tire balls is better than any other inflation system that I've ever used. It is my favorite far and away by like orders of magnitude. This is my favorite tire inflation system for performance, comfort, feedback, responsiveness, bar none. Like this, this is the best inflation system out there if all you care about is performance. Feel and performance, it's tire balls. It's also the most expensive, it's 200 bucks to, to fill a tire with these. It's also the lightest. Um, a, a complete set of these for a rear tire is like a, a, a just under two pounds. So it's, it's, it's the lightest system and it offers the best tunability because you can vary the number of these that you put into a tire and then you can vary the individual pressure of each one of these. You can even get tricky and vary the pressure of every other one of these, which is what some of the guys do. I talked to um, so at the Erzberg Rodeo, Colton Haker, and then um, oh, I'm having a brain fade. Who's the tall guy, the tall American dude? He Cody just, Webb. He just Sherco. Yeah, Cody Webb. Talked to Cody Webb's mechanic at an event one time. They run their, every other one at a different pressure. The advantage of this system is that when you imagine, so here's your tire chain around. This is like a terrible, this sucks. Okay, I'm not even going to try. But here's what I was going to say. Imagine when you're in a turn and your tire is rolled over, your tire wants to tuck in, your tire wants to roll away off the rim. If you have one solid air chamber, that whole tire, the dynamic effects of the roll of, the, of that lateral force is gonna roll the entire tire, see what I did there, entire tire, and it's going to give, a, it's gonna give you sort of that uneasy, that weird sort of your, your front end's gonna feel loose, your bike kind of feels loose in the hard corner. You can offset that by upping the tire pressure, but, but then that has downsides. So everything's trade-offs. When you have tire balls, you're only deflecting the ball that's in lateral contact with the ground. So the ball next, the, 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 the ball sitting here that's ready to go is acting as a stabilizer against this ball, which is deflecting. And so it's sort of maintaining shape before, you, before he gets folded over. And then the one behind it that just came out of deflection, it sort of writes itself up and then becomes fully erect. Can I say that on this? Is this a family show? And it then stabilizes the one immediately behind it. So you have this sort of train effect of one or two balls that are in deflection, but, they're but the neighboring ones are completely intact and completely holding their shape. And so minimal tire deflection, minimal roll in offset. Like it's just, it's incredible how good these are in terms of performance and responsiveness. At the same time, there's nothing worse. If you, if, you, if these things, we, I, I melted a whole tire of these, like Ned was talking about, they don't turn to goo. They just, they just like, they flat, they flat out. They, they don't take heat. They, you cannot ride these on the road. Um, there's, and you can flat these out. They do pinch flat. However, they're way more resistant to pinch flatting than a tube, but they will pinch flat. Ned. Did the, did you have any issue with the front in Baja or only the rear? I had zero problems with the front. Um, all of my problem was with the rear. And so I've even experimented and have run some bikes with, uh, tire balls in the front and then, uh, like a moose in the back. And that is a killer combo. And I, I would run that on all my bikes if uh, it wasn't such a pain in the ass to install these. It is an absolute cat rodeo. 
to get these in because these are so these have to be slimy they you have to coat these with silicone these have to be greasy and your hands are greasy and you're trying to grab these and they're slipping out and you're shoving them into the carcass of your tire how do i do that and they they want to pop out or they want to go sideways more more this way than the other way they're squirming and you get to where you have you know 35 36 37 of these and you're you're shooting for 38 and then like your last two for for nothing you cannot get them in and then one on the top like pops out and then they just it, it's a nightmare it uh it is it's a real catastrophe um so these are the most expensive they're the most finicky they are the best feel there's there there's these are so um they're at the extreme of everything and they are not suitable for overlanders these are not useful i do not reckon what are these for these are for race events these are for track bikes these are for guys who have a good setup in their shop who like the best in performance and are willing to sacrifice the trade-offs to run these um and uh and i would run these if I just wanted to invest more effort and time in the maintenance. If you're a professional guy and you had a mechanic, a team mechanic, duh, use these. But if you're me and you're doing all your own bike maintenance and you're doing your own setup and you're trying to survive a Baja trip, do not use these. So very, very extreme in terms of like upsides and downsides on these. Any questions on tire balls? Has anybody run tire balls? Ned, you've probably run them. What do you think of them? I really like them. I really like the feel. For me, uh, <clears throat> I find bibs, once you, get, once you get used to changing bibs and dealing with bibs, they're really fast and easy to, in, in my view. And I, they're not, tire balls aren't enough different or better to me and I and so basically every dirt bike I have is all on on bib mooses, um, but I, but I like tire balls better. I like the lightweight. I like the feel. Uh, they're just uh, they're more of a hassle. Yep, I agree with all of that. Uh, there's a chat question here. Those balls sound like complete complete pain in the ass. Yeah, they kind of are. They can be worth it. So. Um, yeah, like a lot of things, man. It's it's worth it if you're willing to pay that price. Yeah, I think I'm with you. I would totally use them if I had a factory mechanic. Uh, failing that, I guess I'm I'm not gonna. So. Yeah. Well, you know, after this conversation, it kind of makes me miss tire balls up front. So I think I'm gonna set up my next set of tires with balls in the front, and then I, I run moose exclusively. We'll get to maybe we'll do moose next. You want to do moose next or last? You're you're. Calm. I think we should do moose last, and I think we should do uh, tubeless next. Okay. I agree. Go. Take it away. Okay. So I have a special name for tubeless, which is two tubes. Mm -hmm. Um. Uh. <clears throat> There's, this is like, to me, this is like an oil thread on the internet where everybody has an opinion and you can get people all lit up in a hurry. Uh, but this is, Mike invited me on and right now most people are muted, so I'm gonna say what I think. Um, I find tubeless to be, it's light, it has a great feel. Those two things are 100% and I, and I totally agree with them. Um, I never, I don't run it. I don't like it. I don't even like going on a ride with someone who has it because it has the most failure points. It depends on the wheel remaining round. So if you wind up with a dent in your rim, it's easy to wind up with a failure from tubeless. If you wind up with a tear in your tire, you're done. Uh, I've seen a lot of people have trouble with the inner. So does everyone know how tubeless works? There's kind of a, a, a um, inner tube that's very small in diameter right around the rim. It creates, it's run at very high pressure and it creates a seal. Mike is holding that up right now. So that, that small inner tube creates a seal using that red piece that now you can see on the screen. Um, that creates a seal around the inside of the tire and the rim. The system absolutely works awesome. Uh, the first time you install it on a new wheel, um, it absolutely is light. It gives great feel. You can run really low pressure 
Um, but in my opinion, it's very failure prone, especially where I live. We have a ton of sharp rocks. And uh, um, so there, there's just a hundred different ways for these things to stop holding air. Uh, a lot of times what will happen is you'll wind up with a hole or a tear in the tire itself. And that is easy to fix. You can just run a plug in the tire. Uh, you're good to go. You're done. Um, and so that is sometimes quote an easy fix. But I think if you're going anywhere very far from the truck and you're running tubeless, you have to carry all of the same tire tools and you have to carry a tube that you would have to carry for, for a tube system. So to me, I don't see it as a, any kind of flat proof system. I don't see it as saving you uh, time, energy, weight, et, et cetera, net, because you have to carry all that stuff. So for me, I don't know who the ideal user for tubeless would be. Um, I don't know what the ideal application would be. Uh, I know a lot of people love it, like with a trials tire in the rear, running a really low pressure. You can do that. You get a lot of traction. And it'll help your bike go in places that are otherwise difficult. Um, but you have to carry all of the stuff to fix your bike multiple ways because they're, they're just not, uh, they're not flat proof by any stretch. So I'll, I'll, get off my, I'll get off my soapbox. I think the last thing I would say is I am not aware of any national championship that has ever been even contested, let alone won, on tubeless. Um, almost every off-road, rally, all of that stuff is almost exclusively done on bib mooses. Um, I have seen, uh, like I said, Haker and Endurocross was running tire balls. Uh, but I don't believe anyone ever at any time has ever won a national championship on a tubeless system. And to me, that's kind of the, that's the ultimate test. Hey, Ned, while you were talking, um, they couldn't see what Mike had in place, I don't believe. So maybe Mike could make some noise and, and go to his screen and, and uh, show what it looks like so people get understanding what you're talking about here. Okay, yeah, you're right, Nick, and I, I was kind of noticing that too. Only the person who is talking uh, is goes full screen. Okay, so everything Ned said is bang on, and I completely agree. Um, you go up and down the paddock of any race, um, so any, 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 I don't want to say that no one ever runs them, because I was at King of Hammers, and I saw a handful of guys who had tubeless. Um, I would say this. I have yet to see a guy at the Baja 1000 start line running, running tubeless. So that's, that, that, that doesn't happen. That's not to say that I just haven't seen that guy, but I would never, ever set up a bike. Maybe I could say it like this. I would never let a bike leave my shop with tubeless that was headed out on any race that was, say, longer than a single heat, maybe a single lap, maybe 100 miles. I wouldn't send a guy out to King of Hammers on tubeless. Maybe that would be the one exception because King of Hammers, but even then I'm not so sure. So the, the tubeless system, let's talk about what it is. The tubeless system is this red bladder or this red, this is, um, it's a very thick, very durable inner um, unit here. And, and the technology is very simple. I mean, it's a very clever setup. Basically, you take your rim and you, you cover your rim with rim tape from tubeless and it's a very thick rim tape and you tape over the top of your spokes. So you're, you're creating an air champ, you're creating um, a, a, an airtight rim. So you've sealed your spokes so they won't leak air. Then you put this thing on your rim next. And then this fits down into the channel of your rim, the drop center of the rim. And then this thing, um, sandwiches the tire. Look at me doing this origami with this thing. So the tire, the bead of the tire comes around and then contacts this thing on both sides. Okay. And then the rim is here on the outside of everything. So you have a sandwich where you have the rim, the tire, this on each side, and then on the other side, the, the tire and then the rim. So just visualize those components all together. And then you have inside of this thing here, you have this inner tube. And I just had it out a minute ago. Okay, so you have this very thin, it's like three quarters of an inch tube. And it's as thick, it's probably four mil. And so it's a pretty thick tube. By the way, Tubeless recommends you replace this once a year. 
And so you have this tube that you inflate to like 110 PSI. And when that thing inflates, this thing expands, it gets fat, and then it puts outward pressure against the tire, the, 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 the bead of the tire, and that puts outward pressure against that bead against the rim. So everything becomes expanded, everything becomes very tight, and it's an airtight chamber. And so you have two air chambers. There's two valve stems. You have one valve stem for the, the air chamber that's created inside between here and the tire. Okay, so this is the, this is the tire itself. And so that's an air chamber. And that air chamber you can fill to whatever pressure you want, zero or 10 or 15, whatever you like to run your tire at, that's what you fill here. And that's how the tire, there's a hole in the back of this rim lock. And that air goes into the tire chamber, 10 PSI, whatever you want. This is the Schrader for this inner bladder or this inner tube rather. And that, that fills to like 110 PSI. And so on, on your bike, every ride, you're checking air twice. And this leaks, always leaks, every ride. So we go to Mexico a lot, and, and I never recommend anybody bring these, ever. But guys will bring them. And so every morning, they're checking this, and they're pumping that up. And then they're checking this. And they're typically not changing this, but they're having to pump this up. Um, this system, every time I've been to Mexico, has caused problems on every bike I've ever been with in Mexico. Um, and Ned is right. If, if any of these contact points suffer any kind of integrity, loss of integrity, so this, it's impossible to see this. Here it is right here. Do you see how there's this little edge ridge right here? This is sort of the, the main point of air sealing. And if this, if you damage the face of this when you're installing it, you're probably going to have a leak. Um, if you are using an older tire, if you have a tire that's been sitting on the, the shelf at the tire shop for a long time and the rubber has sort of gone hard in that tire, um, it's prob you may have problems, you may have a failure. Um, that tire needs to be new every time. You can't, you can't use a used tire. Um, on and on and on and on. There's just lots of little idiosyncratic issues with, with tubeless that make it a, a in my opinion, um, I don't want to say a poor choice. Let me say, let me choose my words differently. I do not recommend this for guys where survivability is the number one variable. If you are on an unsupported trip, then as Ned said, you have to carry what I recommend. Here's what, this. I turn off guys to tubeless when I tell them this. You want to go to Mexico with me on tubeless? You must pack an inner bladder. You must pack a 21-inch spare tube. You must pack inflation stuff, you must pack um, a, uh, and all the tools that go along with it. So if you want to come to Mexico on a tubeless, you need to be prepared to fix and replace. And you yourself have to be proficient in replacing this because I'm not going to do it for you. So you have to break down and replace this on your own. And so if you agree to all of that and you're capable of doing all of that, you're willing to do all that, Come to Mexico, bring your tubeless. If any of that's a problem for you, do not bring tubeless. I don't want it on our trip. So who is tubeless for? Tubeless is for the guy who's on a truck ride. You know, you, part, you, you ride, you, 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 um, you drive your truck to the right area and you ride from there and then you come back to the truck. So you're no more than 20, 30, 50 miles away from the truck. Hopefully you have cell phone everywhere you are. It's for the guy who doesn't mind all those conditions that I throw on. When you bring tubeless. Um, tubeless is for the guy who really likes to run zero PSI or three PSI and he flats out tubes and he's willing to make all those other trade-offs. So there really is a, a, a use for tubeless. I, I am, I'm against it for enduro trips. I'm against it for uh, ultimate survivability trips, but I, I do like it and I do use it on certain trips where I know I'm, I'm going to run five PSI on a hard tire, on a, on a, on a six ply tire. Um, the IRC MB5 at like three PSI with the tubeless is a really good combination for certain conditions. Um, but that's a real one-off sort of thing. So I use tubeless as a very specific uh, setup on specific rides 
Um, what else? What, what else should we say about it? Hey, can I throw a little something in on this? Yeah. So a, a few years, a couple years, I don't know, three years back, four years back, give or take, uh, when these first, I don't know, started popping up um, and a lot of people started, you know, talking about them and wanting to use them for dual sporting or, or off-road long, long trips and hauls and stuff like that. Um, I almost bought a, I actually did buy a set, um, but I chickened out and I didn't install them. I went a different direction, which we're going to be talking about a little bit later. Um, but one of the things that I did follow up with trying to sort out between what everyone was praising about at the very beginnings of, of these hitting, you know, kind of mainstream with the dual sport guys or, or off-road guys. Um, you know, I did talk to the, the company, which is new tech that makes these, uh, tubeless system and, you know, um, I guess it's fair to say they did have a first version that had multiple you know, problems and stuff like that. The second version has been better, but even still to that, they market, they are talking to them a little bit more in depth. They personally suggest them for more of the motocross people or people that are looking for ultimate traction and PSI control. Um, but that's not to say that there is a lot of failure, um, prone scenarios that you could be facing um again away from the track stuff on the track you're not going to have a lot of debris and nails and, and you know stuff that would puncture the tire um on the track you know if you if you have a bladder that that explodes and your tire goes flat you pull off and you go back to your truck and fix it right i mean all these things that mike has, has uh, talked about and also ned is also talking about they 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 had stated that it was more towards uh more track use um that's from what I had heard. Now, again, don't, I mean, that's just from what I've been told from them. Um, and, but guys have been, you know, using them on the off-road side of things. Every, I, I've been on multiple rides where dudes had to pull, turn around, couldn't fix their, 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 you know, tubeless and had to literally go back to their truck by themselves because they were holding up the, the ride. Um, that's what made me not install them ultimately the pair that I bought. Um, I ended up sending them back because they just way too much, uh, problematic situations, uh, installation errors, uh, product, you know, on the trail, uh, for long, long term. uh, let alone I, the one thing that I tell people all the time, um, I don't know of any tire that's on the market that has been developed to actually hold air, uh, more than have a tube or some sort of insert in it. Um, these tires aren't like car tires that are made to, to hold air. I mean, I, I don't, that's a, a big one for me. All of that's super valid. I'm watching the chat come on the side and there's a couple of questions. Somebody just uh, asked, do you have to drill a hole for that second rim, the second uh, one? And that's, yes, you do. A lot of our rims come with two holes already. You'll just have to enlarge one of them to account for that big, the big rim lock one. Another question asked, um, what about the ability to use the puncture one of the advantages of a tubeless is the ease of fixing a puncture. And I've got the, you know, we've all seen these. These are like those ATV plugs. These are those gooey, tacky, sticky things. And you use that little spike thing to shove it in there. I forgot to grab those, but I think we're all familiar with these. You can repair up to a quarter inch. Um, if you have some sort of puncture in a tire with tubeless, you can repair it with one of these. I've done that many times. It's very successful. The downside to that is if it's bigger than a quarter inch or it's a Y split, I've had, I had a puncture one time that was, it was not just, uh, it was a cut, but it wasn't just a clean cut. It kind of like went in a different direction. And um, we tried to put two of these in there and we screwed around with it forever and we couldn't get it. So yes, you do have this ATV option of a, of a plug, but not always. And um, the other, the other vulnerability is if you have a screwdriver, and, and, I, and I, we don't know what punctured this one, but something really long in Mexico went into the tire. It punctured not only the tire, but then it punctured the inner bladder. And so we did not have an inner bladder. And so we had a flat out there. I had a guy in Mexico not that long ago. This is a funny story. He, he was a wheelie animal and would pull these like 60 mile an hour wheelies on the road. And when the front tire would, would hit the ground, you would see a puff of smoke like when a jet lands on the runway that contact of the of the un the tire not spinning hitting the road every time his front tire came down there was the puff of smoke he did that about 10 times and he got a flat because the tubeless it was just so much uh, to, like the uh, the uh, lateral force of the tire against the rim against the inner bladder it uh, it just couldn't 
it, it, he flatted out and it popped, it popped the inner bladder. So very finicky, very light. Let me say this, the advantage of the tubeless, it's the most adaptable for extreme low PSI conditions. It is the easiest to fix. If you have a, if you have a puncture that this, you can fix your tire and be back on the road in a couple of minutes if, if this will work for you. And I've had that happen, you know, three or four minutes, we throw this in and we're down the road again. That's strong. It's a very valid, strong argument. It's also very light. It's the second lightest behind tire balls. Tire balls is the lightest. Tubeless is the second lightest. Um, and so for a single track guy out on a ride support, a truck supported ride, it's a really good option for that guy because it has the, the least amount of gyroscopic effect if you want to stay in like the sub $200. Tire balls are better, but they're 200 bucks. A tubeless setup is a hundred bucks. So for a hundred bucks, truck supported rides, the least amount of gyroscopic effect, the tubeless makes a lot of sense for a lot of those types of rides and riders. But for overlanders, dual sport guys, guys who ride their bikes on the road and guys who need ultimate survivability, tubeless isn't for you. Agreed. So um, I have something I'm supposed to do at five. I'm going to push it out about 10 minutes, but I'm going to sort of rush into bids if we can do that. Is that? Yeah, yeah. for sure. For everybody? So uh, um, anyone who's not familiar, a bib mousse is uh, kind of extruded foam. Uh, seems that there's a chunk of a bib. Um, so it's a solid core, it's, it's squishy. Um, and so there are a number of different companies that make them. I'll get into that in a moment. Uh, but the idea is you're filling your tire with something that is, uh, I mean, there's air in your tire, but it's captured in the tiny little bubbles of the bib mousse. So, um, or maybe it's nitrogen, not air even. In any event, uh, it's a, a solid foam insert for your tire. So uh, the pros on a bib, um, uh, first off, uh, you, you really, unless you melt the bib, we'll talk about that more in a minute, but unless you melt the bib, you can't get a flat. So you can put a screwdriver in, you can run nails through it, you can do whatever you want, and they won't, they won't flat. Um, a second thing is uh, they, because they're not running on um, uh, like a single air pocket, uh, when you hit something, uh, there's no way for the, the obstacle to get to the rim. It can't just squeeze the air out to either side. And so you wind up with kind of a, a rising spring rate in your tire, if you will. And, um, and so that means they protect your wheels pretty well. Uh, another advantage of the bib mousse uh, is that they're, um, and I would put this in both the advantage and the disadvantage camp, uh, they kind of have a dead feel to them. So if, if you want to, uh, if you're like bouncing through a bunch of rocks, a bib might be an advantage in that it kind of just soaks some of that up and the bike is a little bit less responsive. In other circumstances, maybe that is a, um, a con instead of a pro. So that kind of goes in both camps. Um, uh, Definitely a downside of bibs uh, is that you are essentially infl uh, installing a fully inflated tire. So that is not a trivial exercise always. Um, and so that's something where you have, with good technique, you'll get to the point where you can put a bib on really quickly. We're also really lucky now, when I started running them, the Rabaconda didn't exist. The Rabaconda tire changer is like, makes a lot of aspects of running bib mousses a lot easier than just a old school uh, doing it either with just tire irons, which is pretty difficult or with uh, kind of an old school um, uh, tire changer. Um, the thing for me is when I run a bib, if a, a properly set up bib, and I'll talk about that in a second, but when I run a bib, I leave all my tools at home. I don't bring an axle wrench. I don't bring a pump. I don't bring a tube, I don't bring tire irons, I don't bring any of that stuff. So uh, that's a level of confidence that I've developed over time with exactly how I set them up and exactly how I use them. But I think that's an advantage anyone can see that that's probably on the order of five plus pounds off your back 
of not having to carry those tools, not having to carry uh, um, uh, a spare tube, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that to me is the big selling point. Uh, they weigh a little more, that's a con, um, but you don't have to carry all the crap. And that, that's pretty nice every single time, I think. Um, so questions about kind of the pros and cons of bibs. And then I have a bunch of notes I wanted to go over about how to set them up and about between the different brands and stuff like that. But let's start kind of by talking about just the concept of bibs and if people have questions about that. Um, Scott, I see your question in chat about uh, being a, a heavier rider. Um, it can be, the issue is uh, the outside of the bib is interfacing with the inside of the tire. And so if you think about the tire squishing on the bottom as at, in every revolution, you're creating a, uh, a friction that's starting to add heat and add heat and add heat to the bib and to the tire. So uh, the slower you're going, the less that's an issue. The lighter weight you are, your bike is, the package is together, the less that's an issue. Um, and in reverse, the faster you go and the more you weigh, the more that you're gonna have an issue with creating heat. What you do to offset that creating heat is two things. One is fit and the other is lube. So fit, the firmer the bib you're running, and really what that is, it's not so much, I know that uh, New Tech makes bibs in a couple different, like um, kind of almost durometers, so to speak. Uh, but I think the bigger issue is how the bib fits in the tire. If the bib fits in the tire really tight, then it's gonna sort of, so to speak, simulate a higher PSI. It's gonna feel like you have more air in your tire, uh, uh, would be a, a, it's like that. And so you're gonna get less movement between the tire and the bib just because there's less deflection on as the tire turns and as the bib hits. Um, the other thing you can do is lube. Uh, my opinion is you can use tire soap, a lot of people do, uh, or you can use the silicone lube that comes with a bib mousse. I think tire soap is fine, but it has a much shorter lifespan. So like if you're putting new tires on your bike every week, um, no big deal, tire soap's probably fine. If you're the kind of guy who's gonna put a, a tire on and think and it's gonna last for months and months, I think tire soap can degrade and become kind of uh, sticky and stop being quite so slippery. Uh, and at that point, you're gonna have more of a, a heat issue. Um, the thing I would say, some people will say, oh, you can't run on the highway with a bib and this and that. And um, I will say, you absolutely cannot run on a bib on a highway with a poorly set up bib. It will fail every time. But if you look at like the Dakar Rally, every single rider, every single bike, they're all on bibs. Um, when I did it in South America, we had 500 mile liaisons. Uh, so that's 500 miles on a highway at a stretch. I don't ever want to do that again on a 450, but I've done it before and, I, and that was what it was. It was over 100 degrees for the entire 500 mile day on the highway. Uh, no issue with bibs. What I was doing, I was running a really stiff tire, a Dunlop 908RR, which is just a, it's an awful, brutal bowling ball of a tire, but they last really well, so that's why I was using it. Um, and then I was running the Michelin Desert Moose, their, their largest size desert rear bib. Putting those things on is like, I mean, you seriously, you wanna have uh, safety glasses, you wanna have like something covering your mouth because you're waiting for tire irons to start flinging out. Uh, it is a seriously exercise in frustration. Um, but it's a very stiff setup and no issue with heat, 100 degrees, 500 miles, 60 miles an hour the whole way. Like bib came out looking perfect, tire didn't wear, uh, not an issue at all. So it can be done, but you have to make sure that you're setting your tire and bib up to what the condition is. And heavier, faster, hotter, those are the things that you wanna you know, keep your eye on as risk factors. Um, the number one question I think, Ned, that I've ever seen is exactly that. Are moose compatible with guys who do trail connections? So they, they, they ride an afternoon of dirt and then they need to go back home. They need to ride a little bit of highway. So you're saying those guys have nothing to worry about, but 
they should make sure that that's a moose that fills the tire properly. Talk a little bit more about the difference between the moose lube that comes with the product versus tire soap, if you can. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I said, I might've mentioned this while you were out of the room, Mike, but just tire soap, I think it's a water-based product. And so I think that as it sits in your garage, you know, it'll, it will tend to evaporate and become less and less slippery, less and less of a lubricant. Um, the silicone is not water-based, so it does not have, it will not diminish over time. Um, you know, that issue of connecting trails home. Uh, so I do, I do that all the time. And quite honestly, I do it on pretty crappy mooses because I'm cheap and I run them until they're way beyond, way beyond well, gone. Um, what's the way beyond? What kind, what kind of mileage? What's that? What kind of mileage? Just, just to put a perspective on that for people. What, what's the mileage that you're saying way beyond? Um, so what I find is when you, when you buy a bib, uh, you're, you're going to buy it in conjunction with a tire and you need to make sure that you get a correct fit for the tire. So we'll talk about that in a second, but if you had a nice tight fit of your bib and your tire, um, and you're changing your tires relatively frequently, like for me, it's pretty rare in a dirt bike, a tire is on for a month. Um, and so, uh, <clears throat> In that circumstance, it's like the first couple of tires, two, three tires are probably going to, I can run the same tire on the same bib and it's probably reasonable getting softer and softer. What I personally do is I buy smaller and smaller tires as my bibs start to diminish in size. Um, then the next thing you do, if you're cheap like me, is you take a razor to your bib, you cut the bib, you make a little chunk like the one Mike is holding up there out of an, another bib because you have a bunch of these things lying around because you've been cheap for a long time and you just start spacing pieces of bib together and packing out the inside of the tire. Um, the test to me is when you put the tire on, obviously you're going to, you know, first side of the tire goes on pretty easy. Second side of the tire starts to get difficult. You have to kind of opposite where you're working with your tire irons. You have to push the bead of the tire down into the dish of the rim. That's how you accomplish getting the last little bit of the, of the tire to seat. And when you finish that, if the tire doesn't seat itself back out onto the bead, if there's not enough pressure inside the tire to do that, you're pretty soft. You're, you don't have a lot of, of, you're not simulating very much pressure. That doesn't mean you can't run it, but that does mean you're going to have to really watch speeds, temperature, load, that kind of thing you're probably going to really like how a soft bib feels, particularly in the rear on the trail. Uh, you get a ton of traction. Uh, it's, it, it has more cushion, et cetera. Uh, but that's not a tire that you're going to want to get on the highway, wick the thing up into six gear and just hold it there for a while. Uh, that's when you start melting down. So Are you running, do you have like a common or a baseline that you're running for mileage out of each bib for your front or rear because I know mine are mine vary from front to rear but do you have just for people listening I'm agreeing with a ton of stuff that you're saying I use yeah. bibs and I love them um, but I'm just trying to help out and give some of those those missing links um, if you can tell everyone what bib you're running and what kind of lifespan of mileage or uh, you're seeing on the variance between the rear and a front sure yeah so so let me talk about brand for a second. The best bibs that I've run are the Dunlops. The Dunlops are pretty hard to get your hands on or have been historically. Um, I like them best just because of durability. They, they seem really stable. They don't shrink. Um, what I mostly run are Michelins. Um, I personally have had really poor experience with the Nitro Moose, the New Tech Nitro Moose. For me, they haven't been stable. They haven't lasted very long. I haven't been impressed with that product. Um, the worst ones that I've ever run are the Golden Tire. Uh, the golden tires, uh, actually they have a nice feel when they're new. They're a little bit softer, um, but they fail catastrophically. They all of a sudden just shrivel and go away. And, and, and so for me, that's not, that's not what I like. So mostly I run Michelin bibs. They're easy to get. They're just over a hundred bucks on like um, Rocky Mountain is where I mostly buy mine. And uh, the problem is that Michelin is the higher different than everyone else. So if you buy like a, a 110 Dunlop, that's going to look very much like about a 130 Michelin in the rear. 
Um, and so that's where that fit issue comes in. Uh, to your question on, on mileage, where I live is pretty abrasive. So a tire for me, most a dirt tire, if I'm, I'm not really talking about dual sport right now, I'm mostly talking about like a trail tire. Right. Trail tire probably lives for like anywhere between 350 and five or 600 miles. Uh, most of the time, that's about all I really get out of, out of what I run. Um, and so uh, I'm going to get a couple of tires out of a bib before where it still feels good. Maybe the third or fourth tire. So now we're talking maybe on the order of a thousand miles, 1500 miles, somewhere in that range. I'm starting to get when I start to get that softer feel, I have a few choices. I can cut bibs up like the one Mike was holding up and chunk them together. So I'm putting lots of pieces of bib together in the tire to create a, to have enough volume, if you will. Um, and the other thing that I do is that I start switching tires around. So I'll go, like I like golden tire front tire. They make a giant one, the 9100. Um, but they make all the way down, they make an 80, 100 that's much smaller. Um, the second number in a tire is the percentage of the width that it is in height. So an 80, 100 is, not the, is in no way as large a volume as a 90, 100, if that makes sense. It's not, um, and so I'll just run 90, 100s for a couple of tires. And then when that starts to feel a bit soft, it starts to get a little vague, then I'll switch to 80, 100s, run a couple 80, 100s across the thing. And then at that point, I'll probably wind up cutting and piecing more pieces together and, and doing whatever else. Um, if I'm going on like a big Baja ride, I'll, go, I'll buy two new bibs and I'll run my Baja ride on new bibs. And then when I get home, those kind of enter the trail riding fleet where for, you know, just kind of day-to-day -day use of I'm going to go out in the afternoon or I'm going to go spend the day on the trail or whatever. Those are the ones that I'm going to cut up and put together to, to kind of bullshit together a decent setup out of stuff I already had and not have to buy more. So. What about rim locks? Uh, another question someone asked about rim locks. I just want to touch on that real quick. My experience has been, and I've, and I've tested this, I've put energy into this. Um, <clears throat> if you, so the first thing is when you're installing a bib, I recommend that you lube the inside of the tire. You want to do a great job. You want to make sure that the whole inside of the tire has that silicone lube or, or tire sealant if you're going to be changing it frequently. Um, once you've lubed the inside of the tire, if you clean off the bead so if you clean off the inner circumference bead of the tire very carefully using like a contact brake cleaner um i do not run rim locks then you don't have to worry about balancing it's not you don't have to worry about putting them on it makes a lot of things simpler and i've used a paint marker and marked across from the tire and the rim and i've never moved I've moved just a little bit and only on the front wheel, which surprised me. I always thought, you know, you like rip a wheelie, you think, well, that would be the maximum amount of torque that you're going to put into the, uh, into the, uh, my experience has been, I've only ever moved the front tire, but I've only ever moved it about half an inch, maybe, uh, where the line that I had on the tire and the line that I had on the rim slipped out of alignment just a little bit. So my takeaway from that was, I'm not gonna worry about this. I don't run rim locks, but I'm very careful with cleaning the bead. So I think some people will just, they have lube all over everything. They put the thing together. There's lube on the, on the uh, rim, there's lube on the bead, there's lube on everything all over the place. You might need a rim lock if, if you approach it that way. Can I toss something in on that subject too? Yeah. So a lot of guys, they, they are trying to figure out how to seat the tire onto the bead and a lot of times there's guys that go and do these for the first few times and they don't seat the bead on the wheel period um okay. and so basically you need to put like basically you put your your air chuck up against the where the hole would have been for the straighter on the wheel and put air into the tire to seat the bead there's been guys that i've gone on rides with have just put you know uh, bibs in and they get there and half the the bead isn't even you know, on the bike and it's already popping off, you know, whatnot. So you have to seat the beat. Yeah. What about guys who have failed the system? The system fails on it because they tie, they, they, uh, what the hell am I trying to say? They tear the cords 
of the sidewall. Have you seen that failure? And what do you have to say about that? Yeah, I have seen that failure. So the key is um, I use long tire irons to remove bibs. I don't have a rabaconda, which makes that even easier. Um, when I put tires on, I don't use long tire irons. I don't, I want to minimize the force going into the equation. So the whole key here is, you know, you probably get to where your tire irons are 10 inches or a foot apart, which is where it starts to get really tight. And that's where you can break the bead, the cable inside the bead of the tire. Um, for me, I've never done that. I've never had that failure. But it's because when you get to that tight point, now you have to focus on the other side of the tire and make sure that that cable and bead kind of drop down into the, the indentation of the rim and get to toward the center where the spokes are in the rim. And if you do that, you won't break the, you won't break the cable inside. If you don't do that, you will. You absolutely have enough strength. You absolutely have enough leverage to break that cable and in the event that you break that cable, the, the tire's toast. It's gonna look perfect. You're gonna roll it out, load it in your truck, get 100 yards from it at the riding area, and, and that's the end of your day, because there's do not pass go, do not collect $200. I apologize, I'm about out of time. Um, I, I have to run, but I, any other questions before I drop off? I don't see anything new on Moose in the comments. Ned, um, you're a genius, man. It's been a joy having you on to be the technical well. expert on this. So Thanks, everybody. It's fun to see y'all. And I hope everybody's sort of staying safe and hope we get through this whole thing here sooner than later. So, All right, dude. Take care. Peace out. We'll stay on if you guys want. If anybody wants to bounce, now would be a good time to drop out with Ned. If you want to stay on, we'll finish up. I've got a couple of notes here. And there's one or two questions that, I, that I've been asked a lot. And so we'll hit those. And then we'll wrap this up maybe in about 10 to 15 minutes. Um, Ned's a badass. Don't, don't, um, don't miss any chance to get his double take mirrors. I know we talked about that at the beginning. Ned is the guy who invented and makes these double take mirrors. So if you need mirrors on your bike, you want to get them from Ned and double take. So just a couple of comments about uh, Moose. So I wasn't on screen. And so when I showed this section of Moose, it didn't come up. But but like Ned, Ned and I are brothers from other mothers. We are a lot alike. I torture test my moose and I make them last way longer than is, than is reasonable or smart probably. And so what this is, is this is a piece of moose that I've cut out of a, of a takeoff. So this is a moose that's already had a bunch of miles on it. I never throw moose away ever. I always save them. And then I slice a section out as needed. So if I have a bike now where the moose is really flabby, weak, and kind of blown apart, then what I'll do is I will cut that moose, and then I will take pieces of other moose that generally represent the same diameter, and then I will, ha I will have pieces up to a foot or so, and sometimes lots of little sections, and I will, and I will kind of insert these into the other moose to plump it up, to increase the diameter of it and try to save and get a second round out of that moose that otherwise should probably go in the trash, but I'll try to salvage it and run it a second time with donor pieces of other moose. And that's why this has hacksaw, and I use a hacksaw, so it's just got hacksaw marks on it and um, lube the hell out of these things. You can never use enough lube um, Ned talked about using like Murphy's tire soap soap. I do not recommend that tire soap is a vegetable based product. And so it's a, it's a water based vegetable oil um, with some, with some solvents in it. And it won't, it, it won't um, destroy the mousse. It doesn't attack the rubber. So there's no problem there, but two things happen. It dries out and then it becomes glue. And then the other problem is, is it will wash out. And so if you're doing a lot of water crossings, then you're going to get water in there and it's going to decrease its ability to sort of act as a lubricant against that tire um, to the moose compound. And the enemy of moose is heat. And anything you can do to minimize heat, lubrication is one thing. And then highway transit sections is the other thing that you have to worry about. And yes, like Ned, I run my moose on the, on the asphalt all the time without fear. 
and I'm in Las Vegas, and I do I do rides where I'll ride to, um, like for example, last year I went to St. George, Utah from Las Vegas. We did about 600 miles, and maybe we put 150 to 200 miles of that on roads, like county roads, little paved roads, and we were running 55 miles an hour, and we would stop every now and then, and we'd put our hands on the rear tire just to check the temperature, just to make sure that it didn't get really, really hot, and um, it never really did, and we never had any problem, and I've, I've got bazillions of miles on moose, and I've personally never had a failure myself. However, I've been with, I've had lots of failures of moose. I've never had a failure on my bike, and the most common moose failure is where what, what Ned was talking about, a guy will go to put his moose on. Here's what happens most of the time. Guys will go to the shop, they'll go to their neighborhood shop and, and they'll ask for a moose and then they don't stock them and so they'll order them in. And sometimes the supplier that they get the moose from has had that moose sit on the shelf for a long time. And these things are like Nerf footballs. They shrink as they age and so, the, the, this this whole scenario that I'm describing is almost set up to fail. Um, and so they'll buy a moose from their supplier and it's old. It's There's a date, there's a manufacturer date on a moose. And you shouldn't use a moose that's older than one year, one year shelf life. Well, they get a moose that's two years old or three years old and it's already shrunk. Maybe it's only at 80% full volume that it was when it was new. Or they order the wrong size because they don't understand the variations between moose size and tire size so they start off with the wrong size moose then when they put it on like what ned was saying they they the kid who's on the tire machine bless his heart he's probably never done one before and so when he puts it on he's using long levers and he doesn't get the bead into the drop center on the opposite side and so he over leverages the tire and it's snapping you can hear that cracking and snapping of, of the cords in the inner bead cracking and breaking and he doesn't know any better and he just leverages the hell out of that thing to get it on there and finally he gets it on and he's so glad that that job's over so, and he's so he can go back to changing the next one which is just a tube and he sends that tire down the road and we take it to mexico and a hundred miles in that tire comes off the rim it walks off the rim because the cords of the bead have are shot it was a ticking time bomb and then that guy's on a on a on a on a double track road, he's doing 50 miles an hour. And then the rear end just goes loose and wonky. And it's just kind of, he's, you know, the back end is just going like this and he stops and we look at it and the tire is off and the moose is trying to climb out of there. And there's no saving that you, you just try to get it in. I've seen guys use zip ties to try to get it back on or just to hold it bailing wire. But when that happens, it's done game over. That tire is toast. And, um, in both instances, we had a chase truck and we reused the same moose, but we put a new tire on and we installed it properly. And that tire moose setup lasted the rest of the trip. So a moose represents two ends of the spectrum, the most reliable of all of the systems because you cannot flat a moose. There's no way you can flat this and there's no maintenance. Once you've got this in your system, in your tire, you don't have to check air pressure, you don't have to do anything to it. So at one end of the spectrum, you're dealing with a system that's the most reliable and robust and, and, and proven and solid. But at the other end of the spectrum, it is prone to um, if, uh, faulting out or failing at the highest level due to inattention, lack of understanding, poor choice of sizing, poor installation. So you've got the best of both um, worlds with, you've got the best system, but it's the most um, liable uh, to getting screwed up by the installer. Chris, you had something? Yeah, I think it goes with some people that have, and, and Ned's the one that got me in the mooses back in like 2011, and I haven't looked back, but the thing I like to explain when people are thinking about going from tubes or tubeless um, to moose is what you're just getting at because I value my time on that bike, what little I can get on that bike. So I'm going to spend more time researching or maybe more time wrestling that moose in the shop when I have the controlled conditions and do that just so I do not have that, that possible failure outside on the trail. 
like put the time where I value it on the trail. I'll spend more time in the garage. I'll wrestle that thing more. I'll spend more time. Um, just like you guys, I store all the old pieces. Now I do one thing I added, you know, same thing, these dry rot over time. So all of mine are in garbage bags, black garbage bags. And I'll even make sure there's, you know, there's some lube or something like that I have after it. I don't keep them out. I don't keep them in the original cardboard box. I keep them in garbage bags. Just a little tip on that. Yeah. And so do you have any experience using anything other than the silicone lube they come with? Have you, have you ever run the soap? No, I've used the uh, new tech lube. I've used the, all the different lubes that come and are specific to mooses. I haven't, I haven't done that shortcut yet. I've thought about it in a pinch because I've run out and I was like, well, you know, I could just, I got soap here, you know, I'll try it out, but I, I I've never done it. And then what, and then Nick, I say you put your hand up. So um, we'll get to you in 10 seconds. So Chris, what do you do about your abandoned uh, valve stem holes? Um, I'll put on the inside, I will tape them uh, just to, because I've noticed that a lot of times that's water can get in there. Uh, and also it's a spot I've noticed that the lube actually comes out and it's a possible place to start drying that out. So I'll just tape it. I've thought about putting a valve core on that and then using it as a place to stick more lube in or, you know, I've thought of the idea of who wants to drill out four, three more, you know, or two more and then use them as lube points. But I just like Ned, we ride in Colorado. So we're going to blow through a tire and that's your point to lube it. That's your, that's your one maintenance point. When you're putting a new tire casing on it, rub, you know, put another tube of the lube around that thing. Okay, good. Uh, Nick. I, I think everything that Ned talked about, what you talked about, what, what Chris just said, it's all for a dual sport guy riding long mileage, connecting highways and, uh, wanting to stay on the bike and not be on the side of the road, patching, you know, having failures and whatnot. Uh, uh, moose is definitely where it's at. Once you get over that initial new to it hump of figuring things out, um, and that's where you connect with people that, that have already been through all those struggles, um, you, you actually just say, why didn't I do this a long time ago? Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, it's, they're great. Um, I, the one, thing that I've been using is the uh, I got a big pail of, of um, the zip tie racing loop and and that's what I'm running um, I've been running that for a, probably a little bit over a year and a half and before that I was running a uh, loop called in force it's really hard well it's somewhat hard to find um, but that's what I've been running I don't use uh, I run nitros and I don't use the, the new tech um, loop for the reason that obviously um, I only get one tube per box and what have you, but um, the other side is that it's a little messy. So it gets uh, like leaf stains on the floor. Just like, it's just, it's messy. Um, the other lube that I'm running, the zip tie stuff is, is not as messy. Um, and let alone every time I change a tire, I'm still running the same uh, bib. I have plenty of lube to go around, I'm not shorting it at all. And what do you do about your abandoned um, uh, stem uh, holes, the holes in your rim? So in the past, um, I tape it from the outside because I'm utilizing the hole uh, for the valve stem to put air in the tire to be the tire. So I put a piece of duct tape, uh, black duct tape, so it matches real nice on the black wheel. Um, and I just, you know, if it starts to get tatered out or whatnot, then I replace it. Um, but on a brand new set of, uh, bibs and, and tires that I have in the garage right now that I'm working on the bike, uh, prepping it, I had bought a set of, uh, valve stems, um, the ones that, that you, uh, screw together with the seal. And I'm going to try that out and then utilize that for my air. So I don't have to keep on, uh, putting, you know, uh, duct tape on the, over the hole. So I'm going to try that. I've done all those things. Um, DRC out of Japan, they make little rubber uh, stem hole plugs and you put those on the inside. I typically do that. I've also used uh, electrical tape on the inside. I've used yep. valve stems. So I, yeah, I like all those. Um, Ned, I took notes when Ned was talking just to, as we wrap up here, a couple of things. Uh, I recommend that you lube not only the tire, before you put in the mousse, but also the mousse. So lube them both. I have a pail, it's a coffee can with a stiff brush 
and I pour silicone oil in there. And so I'll just use, I'll dip it in there like paint and then I will brush and paint the inside of the tire and then I'll get my hand in there and then I'll use that to coat the, the mousse and I'll, it's a mess, it's a disaster. I typically do it outside on the ground uh, on some gravel and then I shove all that together and then put it on. Um, you can do this 100% adequately on the, on the ground with tire to tools, tire levels, levers. We've even had, uh, we've even as an experiment used the little 10 inch levers. We used five of them and we got it on. Now two guys and we, you know, it took some wrestling, but we got it on. Rim locks. I'm a little different than Ned on that. I run rim locks on my rear every time, 100%. I, uh, maybe it's a peace of mind thing. I know there's a good, he makes a good argument and I'm on board with that, but I run locks anyway. And I run the same uh, metal rim lock that I showed earlier. This uh, Warp 9 is a really good one. I like it. It's metal and it bites into the tire really well. Maybe I'm lazier than him. I do not clean any of the lube off of my tire, the sidewall, none of it. So um, maybe that's where we were different. And I do not run a rim lock on the front. I only run a rim lock on the rear. And then I balance it. And we think we talked about these earlier. I use the sufficient number of um, these spoke rim weights to balance out that rim lock and I do that on the rear every time. Um, we talked about cutting the moose. As far as brands, I'm with Ned. I'm partial to Michelin. Michelin invented the bibs in 84 for the Dakar rally and they seem to continue to be on the forefront of moose sort of uh, formula. I use, so my favorite in feel, like him, I ran a set of Dunlops and they are superior but uh, Dunlop, for whatever reason, has not mass marketed their mooses, and you can only get them through race distribution, and they're very expensive, and they're hard to get, and so I don't run them, because I can't get them. Um, Motaz, Moto Z, they used to have a fantastic moose that felt very comparable, but they stopped importing it to the U.S. They had some manufacturing problems. Um, then, let's see, what else have I run? I've, I've run Golden, and I really like the feel of Golden, but it was on a test bike, and I did not have enough I didn't run it like Ned where I ran a full tire, so I don't know what he knows that they fade off and fall away. I've run a lot of nitros and I like, so here's what I like and don't like. Nitro to me has been the most inconsistent with out of the box sizing. That is to say, I will buy a nitro that is still in date code and it is 10, 20% undersized of what it should be consistent, not consistently, but that's happened randomly. Now, their customer service is very good. They sent me another one. They told me to just keep the one, um, which, uh, you, know, you know, so that's like really good customer service. So very responsive, very good customer service. Um, they're a good organization, but their product um, inconsistent, very inconsistent. I also don't like their standard compound. It weighs you know, two and a half times what a Michelin weighs. It's very dense. It's very buoyant. Uh, this is a Michelin here, and it has a very good compliance to the, the feel of it. And Ned talked about moose having a dead feel. I would argue that once you get used to that and you, and you properly set your suspension up, that is the way that you're, that's the way your bike should feel. That's the neutral feel that your bike should have the, the return bounce buoyancy of air is not the way that your suspension should feel. So I've come to the point now where I hate riding a bike with air. If I have to ride somebody else, I don't run air on any of my tires. And I will hop on a guy's bike to ride it up a hill climber or whatever. And I'm on his bike and I have to, I hate it. I don't like it. It, it is too responsive. It's too lively, too much feedback. And, and, I, and I don't care for it. So um, I would argue that the dead feel, the air quote dead feel of a moose is how your suspension should feel. And when you tune to that, when you tune your bike suspension to that, it's safer. I would argue it's safer and it, it is less fatiguing on the rider and it gives you more confidence as a rider and you have a better experience on a moose, on a, on a well-chosen moose tire combo than anything else. Then tire balls. Again, I would go back and qualify that and say tire balls is better, but tire balls has too many disadvantages. The moose is the number two, in my opinion, set up in terms of the compromises that you're making. Um, 
So Michelin is my brand. That's my go-to brand. I run Michelin exclusively. Um, now I have not tried. So uh, with the, with the nitros, I know a lot of guys and Nick is a fan and I know a ton of my buddies who, who do not have the problems I've had. And, and I'm, and I concede the point. Maybe I'm, maybe I got a bad batch. Maybe I'm more picky or I scrutinize it better, or I don't know, but I, I do not use nitros and I don't recommend it. Now I don't not, I don't dissuade you. So that is to say, I, I'm not going to bash them, but I don't recommend them. Um, now they've just come out with the new formula, the soft nitros. I have not run those and I, uh, I need to order a set this week and I'm going to try them out and I'm excited and optimistic because I like, I like the guys at new tech. So I'm hopeful that the new compound solves some of those problems of the past. I hope that they compete. This is what I hope. I hope they change my mind away from Michelin, but right now Michelin's what I run and have, and have, and, and, and have, and have got a lot of time on Nick. You had something. I think for talking about the different ways of going and, and again, there's a huge diversity. And when you say you're a dual sport rider or an off-road rider, um, there's a huge diversity on what kind of, Um, one of the things that I do push on people about, and, and I will tell you, I want to try a set of the Michelin's like what you're saying. Um, I've only ran on nitros just to, you know, just so that's, it's out there. I'm would love to run, you know, something different to try them out myself. But like a lot of guys that I've tried to persuade, like, you know, I'd prefer to ride with guys with a, a bib just for the, the fact that we can just keep on running. We don't ever need to stop and we don't have any worries and what have you. Um, but you know, it goes along with say is that when you hit rock, like if you're going down, um, you know, any type of, of trailer or single track, or whatever it is, rocky section, it takes a lot, it, the, the, it's a lot less abuse on you. So when you're going on longer rides, like you're getting over stuff better. I mean, there's so many just advantages to it that you just cannot ignore that, that it is something that, that you should be looking at, um, for your bike, uh, to upgrade to. Um, and the other thing too, that I, that I push a lot of when I recommend them is to move from an 80 series tire up to a 90 series tire. Um, Ned had, had mentioned that, um, on oh, with, yes. the way that he flip flops tires around and stuff like that, which, which I've never done it the way that he's done it. Um, I take out, uh, bibs. Like if I go on a big long ride, that's, you know, 600 to a thousand miles, I'll put a brand new set in and run a brand new set and then I come home and take them out and I put an older set back in when I'm doing the 50 to 100 miles just so I can keep on you know rolling the pace out on on what was available for that top for that bead uh excuse me for that bib um but going up to a new series plus having a bib is I mean it's just so nice on that front end to where you can just hit whatever you want and and you don't have to second guess it or, or cringe when you're about to hit something and have that another thing in your head of like why you can't get over an obstacle. Um, it, to me, it made that much of a difference and other people I've talked about, it's made that much of a difference as well. What's your take on, on the 80 to a 90 on the front series? I, yeah. I only run 90 on the front because I want the rim protection and I want the comfort that the, that the, that the taller tire offers. And so I've now converted to, to 90 only and I run a stiffer front end moose I really pack it and I'm very, I don't, I don't beat up a front moose. As soon as that starts to go away, I change it. The rear end, I will run a rear end until it almost feels flat because I prefer the traction. But on a front end, I'm very conservative and I'll do two or three front mooses to every single rear moose. Um, and Garrett, you were kind of nodding your head a lot of this. I know you've got experience on moose. What, as we finish up, why don't we finish up with Garrett, Garrett? Take us out. I actually kind of knew the bibs, but um, I'm a believer. Um, I still remember the first time uh, I put the set in and went up my first ride. And um, I always was leery of pinch flats. I ran the uh, Bridgestone Ultra Heavy Duty, ran a lot of air pressure because I didn't want to flat. And anyways, put a set of bibs in, went for my first ride and found the rockiest, nastiest, kind of high speed two track with big old boulders and just pinned it and uh I couldn't quit grinning man it was amazing it um yeah it's it's uh bibs all the way now for the most part I'm in a bit of a quandary got a big ride coming up hopefully this uh late summer it's gonna be a really long one with a lot of 
well, all high speed gravel roads, blacktop kind of stuff for the most part. And I don't know. I don't know what we're going to run yet. Maybe we'll try a set of uh, Michelin bibs. We'll see. Um, like you were saying about the uh, valve stem, um, running the bolt in the bolt in uh, valve stem for the for the old two pole. Um, yeah, my buddy Bryce there suggested that. That's what we put in for uh, for running Baja. We just put it in the uh, valve stem where we could bolt it in. Okay, fellas, anybody have any last questions or any comments? Anybody want to chime in and then we'll we'll shut this down. One more thing on my side. For people that are asked the one question that I don't think we touched on, for everyone talking about tubes and bibs online, what is your take on air pressure feel from running air and running a bib? Because I see that pop up a lot. What, what's your take, Mike, if you can maybe just touch on that before we get off? Yeah, nitros are the hardest in my opinion. So a nitro to me feels like it's probably 15, 16, 17, the standard nitro. Now the soft nitros, I have no idea. I haven't, I haven't had them. Um, the golden, golden comes in two different versions and the golden soft is the softest I've ever seen. And those felt like four or five. The Dunlops felt like six or seven. And these are, I'm kind of making up numbers and I'm sort of going off memory. Um, I would say the Michelin is really middle of the road. My Michelins that I just put on the other day feel like probably 11. The rear side, and again, so one, one caveat here is that is size, like, like the ladies say, size matters. So depending on how much you stuff into that, re into that tube, are you running? Now, I like to run a 130 size rear and a 140 size moose because on the, if I, if, okay, that setup, if I'm going to head out on, um, on a long trip, I'm going to oversize that moose because I'd rather start out stiff and have it fade away and fade down to survivable, serviceable at the back end of the life than run it at the, then right size it and have it fade away and then become an issue. So I would say this and I'll finish and I'll shut up and then we'll end and anybody else can talk. I would say that if you want to run moose, you really need to educate. It's the system that requires the most education. You need to spend the most front end work, understanding it, figuring it out, um, hopefully connecting up with the guy who can lead the way. Like, like Chris, I think lucked out. You got with Ned and Ned really showed you the ropes on moose. You can spend a lot of time and money and effort making a lot of mistakes with moose, having breakdowns with moose. Again, like I said, it's the system that offers the most benefits, but has the most, probably the most potential for really screwing it up. So if you can have a mentor, a moose mentor that kind of, you know, lets you, helps you understand all this, you will do well. Um, if that's your situation, then you're lucky. Uh, you can get this on YouTube. You can call me. There's plenty of ways you can, you can get this information. But when, when you have the right setup of moose, it's, it's the best system. So that's it. I'm done. Somebody else take us out. Good, good info on the oversize. I'd never heard that before. Um, it make, I understand the concept. It makes sense to me. Um, you know, obviously being new to it, I just looked at the, looked at the chart, got the right size for the tire I was running and away we went. So it was right sized. Um, I could see for a really long run, ride, trip or whatever, oversizing, I could see maybe the benefit in that. Okay, fellas, any last comments? Thanks All for good stuff. This. Yeah. All right, everybody. Thanks for everything. Take care. See you on the trail. Thanks, Thank sir. you.